Hello, I'm Steve Corey. In my first video, Gobekli Tepe, Noah's Monument to God's Ark, I promised to show you the evidence verifying that God's first prophet to mankind, Enoch, was indeed the source of the symbols carved onto Gobekli Tepe's mysterious Pillar 43, and that their arrangement encrypts a message to mankind from the God of the Holy Bible, written centuries later by the prophets God sent to his people of Israel. That is an enormous statement to make. It fits with neither the orthodox view of Gobekli Tepe, nor with science's fundamental rule that no physical phenomena shall be explained by any reference to God. Therefore, this Enoch proposition demands enormous real evidence for support because the demonstration of its truth will require a giant paradigm shift in both orthodox history and science's own rule book. Evidence fully supporting this Enoch proposition does exist in an enormous amount. This video introduces that evidence, how it decrypts Pillar 43's symbols, and it introduces the several videos that accomplishing this task will require. I'm standing inside the front door of my office where I have arranged a pictorial display of the Enoch proposition for my client's perusal. One of these illustrations I prepared specifically for this display. The rest were taken from my book, Clear Signs of Trouble and Great Joy, What Everyone Should Know About the Bible, History, and the Future, From the Sky to the Earth. I began writing my book about signs in the sun, moon, and stars Jesus said would precede his return. He said you will know your redemption is drawing near when you begin to see them. Deep into my research, I discovered Gobekli Tepe held monumental relevance to those celestial signs of Jesus Christ's return. What? How can that be? Irrefutable evidence of Noah's involvement in Gobekli Tepe's construction is carved on the very face of Pillar 43. Jesus related Noah's days to his return by saying, As were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days, before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they did not know until the flood came and swept them all away, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Genesis 6.3 intimates that God informed Noah of the flood 120 years before it happened. The ancient Hebrew history book, Jasher, tells us that Noah warned his generation of the world's impending doom. But the fact that only Noah and his family boarded the ark reveals that everybody else was too full of self-satisfaction, pleasures, drunkenness, and other cares of the world to heed the warning. The flood came. They were all washed up because they paid no heed to warnings. Soon after Gobekli Tepe was unearthed in our days, Andrew Collins, Graham Hancock, and a few other investigators of ancient historic mysteries speculated that this monument, and especially its Pillar 43, were constructed specifically to warn a far distant generation of a great cataclysm to come upon them. You are about to see Pillar 43 affirm those speculations. Like a properly assembled jigsaw puzzle, history, the gospel portrayed in the constellations, and prophecies from the Holy Bible combined with Pillar 43's symbols to form a coherent depiction of a great cataclysm coming upon earth, followed by an even greater glory. Signs in the sun, moon, and stars shine confirmation upon that picture made by this assemblage, verifying that those investigators of ancient mysteries guessed right about cataclysm, although their speculations were not specific. Yet, Pillar 43's warning is found to be very specific. If you are skeptical about that statement, then you are pretty normal. It is good to be skeptical 
until you have sufficient evidence by which you can know. My job is showing that evidence to you. Your job is to be true to skepticism, honestly considering empirically observable evidences. Skepticism's real nature leads to empirical investigation. To deny a possibility without examining its evidence is arrogant. Honest skepticism humbly desires truth. Therefore, it welcomes evidence. Basing conclusions on anything less than the honest contemplation of all available evidence stops your mind from traveling the far-reaching paths of amazing realities. Refusing to explore inconvenient evidence, fake skepticism seeks nothing more than what might conveniently support its own predetermined beliefs. But if you appreciate reality's amazing sights, if you long to actually know more about what real evidence shows to be true, then reason through all evidence with a desire to uncover reality's great mysteries. True skepticism guards truth, but faking skepticism while blindly denying evidence locks you into a mental prison made of a million coveted falsehoods. Be a true skeptic. Discern concepts by their evidences rather than by prejudices, orthodoxy, or social conventions. Gobekli Tepe was discovered by this generation of the end, the generation to whom Jesus' signs in sun, moon, and stars have now been revealed, the generation to whom Enoch, Noah's great-granddad, addressed his warning in the first words of his book, saying, These are the words of the blessing of Enoch, to bless the elect and righteous, who will be living in the day of tribulation, when all the wicked and godless will be destroyed. God opened the eyes of the righteous Enoch so that the angels could show him a vision of the Holy One in the heavens. From them I understood that the vision I saw was not for my generation, but for a far distant one. It isn't so much amazing that the far distant generation to whom Enoch addressed his warning was the same generation which has now found Enoch's warning on Pillar 43, as it is amazing that it's God's nature to communicate even in the way he does things. Surely the Lord God does nothing without revealing his secret to his servants, the prophets. In many and various ways, God spoke of old to our fathers by the prophets. Enoch also wrote that he taught his son, Methuselah, everything the angel revealed to him. Methuselah was Noah's granddad. Hi, I'm Sadie Schmitz, Steve Corey's granddaughter. You know how granddaddies are with their grandkids? The Bible states that Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation, who walked with God. It isn't so much a speculation that Methuselah passed on to Noah everything Enoch taught him, as it is human nature, especially in those early years of humanity, when tradition was far more highly regarded than it is in today's liberalism. The amazing correlations Pillar 43 bears with the Bible, which you will see in our series of videos, thus had a recognizable path of transmission from mankind's first prophet, through his son, to Noah, who carved it onto Pillar 43. Enoch's book was well known and highly regarded by both the first century A.D. Jews and the newly developing Church of Jesus' followers. Many Old and New Testament concepts are attributable to Enoch's book. Even Jesus' brother, Jude, quoted it in his letter. Enoch, in the seventh generation from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord came with his holy myriads, to execute judgment on all, and to convict all the ungodly of all their deeds of ungodliness, which they have committed in such an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Enoch's book continued to be highly regarded and quoted throughout the first three centuries of church history. Then it was lost. Thirteen hundred years later, 
Two and a half centuries ago, Enoch's book was rediscovered in Ethiopia only a few years before the birth of Frances Rolston, who spent her life developing what became the key for deciphering Enoch's message encrypted within Pillar 43's symbols. One hundred thirty years after she had rediscovered how the gospel is told in the constellations, Pillar 43's key, Gobekli Tep was unearthed like an ancient time capsule packed full of information. How the gospel told by the star's key fits into Pillar 43's encrypted lock was discovered only a few years ago. Now, watch this key unlock Pillar 43's great mystery revealing Enoch's warning of the end written to this far distant generation of ours the very same generation which found Pillar 43. It's just the way God works. Francis Rolston was born in 1781, nine years after the British explorer James Bruce left Ethiopia with the newly rediscovered Book of Enoch. She spent her life searching for the linguistic roots of an early Christian proposition that the 48 constellations of the zodiac were anciently formulated to express the gospel of Jesus Christ. By the time of her death in 1864, she had not finished her research. Her notes were later compiled into the book, Maseroth, or the Constellations. Maseroth is the Hebraic term for constellations, used at Job 38.32, quoting God's response to Job's complaining. Can you lead forth the Maseroth in their season? God reasoned. God also mentioned the Pleiades, Orion, and the bear with its children, that is, Ursa Major. This is an indication of the antiquity of the Maseroth, as Job is considered by many to be the oldest book in the Bible. Other historical references to and depictions of the constellations reveal an even greater antiquity. Nobody has yet been able to show the origin of the constellations or adequately explain their ancient spread around the world. But today, you will know. The illustration you are looking at includes only the region of the Maseroth which Rod Hale, an associate of Andrew Collins, found to precisely overlay the face of Pillar 43's symbols. Incredibly, Every constellation in this region of the sky expresses a principal element of the gospel, from Christ's birth, through his death and resurrection, to his return to destroy evil. If the Lord avails me time and opportunity, I will prepare for you a video exploring the role of all 48 constellations in expressing the Bible's salvation narrative, and the similarities of the gospel element depicted by each constellation with the essential substance of the ancient Western world myths ascribed to each. But for now, I will point out only those constellations relevant to this introduction. Time permits just hurried thumbnail sketches, so pay close attention for the next few minutes. Cepheus portrays the King of Kings, Jesus Christ resurrected as God, the greatest of all powers. In Rolston's school of thought, Cassiopeia is Christ's beloved bride, the resurrected church. But Pillar 43 shows something even more basic about this constellation. I will show you that shortly. From ancient times, Jewish rabbis have considered Ursa Minor to represent Israel. Mark that in your mind. It is of major significance. Draco, of course, is the dragon, the ancient serpent who convinced Eve, the mother of all living, as Adam called her, to eat the fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, the opening of Pandora's box, the beginning of mankind's rebellious nature of liberally twisting up God's truths. But Cygnus, the waterfowl, also known as the Northern Cross, 
represents the sacrificial work of Jesus Christ, always available for any man's salvation who believes him. On one hand, Pegasus displays the security and provision sent from heaven to those who do follow Jesus, while, on the other hand, Hercules depicts Christ's descent into Hades and return from there possessing the keys to the gates of Hades for releasing all his followers from the grip of their deaths. Bootes represents the resurrected Christ's return to earth to do just that. Sagittarius represents Christ in the process of dispatching the sting of death, Scorpio, to establish the eternal life of his followers. But Ara, the flaming altar overturned onto earth, depicts the wrath of God poured onto Christ's deniers. They will wail and gnash their teeth, locked in the throes of eternal death. The Southern Cross, Centaurus, and Victima show Jesus subjecting himself to death on the cross, giving him power over death to release his followers and justifying his wrathful vengeance upon those who deny him. These fourteen constellations depict the salvation narrative as expressed in the Holy Bible. As yet, to you this must seem merely a speculation. The verifying evidence of the gospel in the stars does not lay in something as easy as the linguistics of star names. As Francis Rolston proposed, but it lays in the meaningful correlations found within a very large set of literary, archaeological, and astronomical observations. Keep this proposition in mind as you watch my video series, and you will begin discovering the complex evidence establishing the truth of Enoch's book. In those days the angel Uriel answered and said to me, Behold, I have shown you everything, Enoch and I have revealed everything to you that you should see in this sun and this moon and the leaders of the stars of the heaven and all those who turn them, their tasks and times and departures. The archangel Uriel is the secondary source of the Maseroth, which wicked mankind liberally twisted into the zodiac. God is the primary source. He not only displayed them, he made them. Orthodox archaeology's statement that we can't know anything about Pillar 43's message aside, the debate amongst everyone yet trying to solve its message resolves around whether its symbols represent an ancient comet impact or whether they depict the nature of death and possibly life thereafter. In an article co-authored with Rodney Hale, Andrew Collins stated, Identifying the pillar's main vulture is always going to be central to this debate, a realization that has preoccupied the minds of every investigator who has examined its stone since Spanish archaeoastronomer Juan Antonio Belmont identified its carved scorpion as a representation of the constellation of Scorpius. The vulture's close proximity to the scorpion has suggested to some that it is Sagittarius, while to others it is Cygnus. Collins' speculation about identifying the main vulture with either Sagittarius or Cygnus could not have been more accurate and we will soon discover how both constellations will resolve the debate between comet impact or nature of death and resurrection. Rodney Hale discovered how the constellations of the northern sky overlay the symbols of Pillar 43 far too consistently for mere coincidence to explain. Extending beyond coincidence even farther, these are the same constellations Francis Rolston proposed to be depicting the Gospel's central theme of death and resurrection. The biblical story of salvation correlating with the same constellations overlaying the symbols of the same stone upon which is clearly carved the biblical account of the Great Flood stirs up the only solution for completely deciphering Pillar 43 
unless normal science desires to abandon its search into orderly interrelationships. But of course, orthodox archaeology, without so much as giving this colossal amount of coherence one momentary thought, will beg off even the rational explanation, calling upon mere coincidence instead, since normal science's rule book has banned from consideration any call upon God for explaining observable phenomena. It is unscientific and even deceitful to claim any knowledge about what you are unwilling to study, research, or simply observe. Allowing no proposition about God for an explanation of anything is certainly biased. It is blindly biased, the very epitome of bias. Being a skeptic, too, before I could accept Hale's proposition, I had to see it for myself. I used a freebie astronomy program to print a constellation map of Gobekli Tepe's 9600 BC northern sky. If time permits and the Lord desires, I will produce a video showing you how to do this as well. When I overlaid my map of constellations onto an image of Pillar 43, my thinking about Gobekli Tepe, the constellations, biblical prophecy, and the Lord God forever changed. I realized God was far more communicative than I had previously thought, and that mankind knew more about Jesus Christ's salvation story earlier in its history than has ever been acknowledged. My thinking changed not because I am gullible, but because I am barely humble enough to understand that coincidence cannot explain enormous pools of completely coherent information. These must be explained by their own realities. In the case of these three intermingling pools of information, reality demands the existence of not just any prophecy, such as that of Nostradamus, but only that prophecy of the Holy Bible regarding the woman's seed born to crush the serpent's head. Sorry, science philosophers, your own beloved empirically observable, mechanistically material universe has been caught red-handed, demanding prophecy from the God of the Bible to be the only explanation for these symbols carved beneath that ancient depiction of the Holy Bible's flood narrative, accurate to even the number of months those waters covered the earth. This is the overlay I developed. It duplicates Rodney Hale's work in accord with the scientific principle of consistency. That is, both of us were able to generate a workable overlay. Of course, we are looking at the overlay in keeping with the scientific principle of observation. Anyone can empirically observe the pillar's motifs being overlaid by the constellations of the zodiac. Unfortunately, science has lied about what is and is not natural. It falsely demands no call upon God be made for explaining any phenomena. Chapter 2 of my book, Clear Signs of Trouble and Great Joy, explains the adjustment science must make in order to repent of its lie and discover the rest of what is real. And 2. The Realm of Spirits for Jesus Christ is the Lord of Spirits, a title Enoch made for him. What I am showing you now scientifically verifies the existence of that spirit realm. I discovered this information by making predictions of what should yet be discoverable through the consideration of what I had already observed if the constellation overlay of these motives were directed by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, upon Noah's great-granddad, Enoch. When I went looking for the results of my predictions, I found what you will see in this series of videos. That is, the scientific principle of predictability. 
You will see this information pool fill many more predictions, such as one obvious one. If the Holy Spirit did inspire the shapes and placements of the motifs to correlate with a message he also gave to Enoch in the form of constellations, a message that included a most seriously somber warning to the generation of the end, as Enoch said in his book, then the pillar and the gospel message in the constellations would both become known again by the time of this generation of ours. Not only was Pillar 43 discovered by this generation to whom Enoch said the warning was sent, but you will see the pillar's own verifying statement made about Enoch's knowledge and the gospel in the constellations. Everything we are going to see will lend itself to making more testable predictions in keeping with the scientific principle of testability. I have observed so much evidence underpinning the accuracy of my proposition that I no longer think of it tentatively. In other words, further information might show my proposition to have been underdetermined by the evidence so as to make of it an entirely different proposition. You should consider what I am showing you tentatively until the evidence you will have seen reaches a critical mass beyond which there is no doubt remaining. That is my goal. Let's make another prediction and see if it tests true. If Pillar 43 was made in accord with God's inspiration to send a message to our generation verifying that Jesus Christ's return will happen in our generation, then we will find the pillar making some indication about our current days in correlation with some other indication made in the biblical prophecy of his return. Zechariah 14, 16-17 says, Then everyone that survives of all the nations that have come against Jerusalem shall go up year after year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of booths, and if any of the families of the earth do not go up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, there will be no rain upon them. At Jesus' return, Israel will be raised above all the nations. At the time of Gobekli Tep, the celestial north pole was in Hercules overlaying the disk on the main vulture's wing. By the time of the great flood, according to its biblically implied date, Due to the wobble of the Earth's axis, the celestial North Pole had moved to Thuban, the last star of Draco's tail. Today, all of the stars rotate around the last star of Ursa Minor's tail, Polaris. Ursa Minor happens to be that constellation anciently regarded by Jewish rabbis to be the representation of Israel. And there it is not only overlaying Pillar 43, but overlaying it in a greatly meaningful location. Note that only two constellations of the Maseroth overlay the path of moons through the great flood waters, Draco and Ursa Minor, both being constellations having harbored the celestial North Pole. Also note the only three Maseroth constellations overlaying the three rooms of God's Ark. Cassiopeia, the constellation obviously depicting a woman's legs in birthing position, overlaying the room upon which sits the waterfowl chick. Cepheus, the constellation representing the king of kings, overlaying the room upon which sits the animal with the greatest horn display of all, an ibex. And then Ursa Minor, Israel's constellation having mostly fallen from its glorious place in the room upon which sits the lowly, downward-facing reptile crawling in the earth's dust. But of course, its tail star, Polaris, remains in the glorious room where it has, in our very own days, become the central star of all the stars, the celestial North Pole, just as Israel will become the nation around which all nations will revolve 
after Jesus Christ has gloriously returned to the great joy of everyone following him. While we are here, looking at this successful test of that prediction, let's note another piece of directly confirmational evidence carved right onto the face of Pillar 43. Note how Draco's overlay hangs from the path of moons through the great flood waters like a snake hanging from a branch. Now, note the downward facing snake off to the right. It is most obviously Draco. Their match is perfect, undeniably intentional, and patiently await the great blessing shown by that little donut in front of the snake's bird beak faking tail. So, it is quite amazing that the celestial north pole rests in the tail star of Ursa Minor, if you ascribe all of this to coincidence. It is extraordinarily communicative if you ascribe it to the directive work of God's Holy Spirit, especially when you consider the Spirit's other directive work, the Holy Bible. Since science is more in love with explaining even the greatest amount of biblically correlating order by coincidence than it even cares to research its extensively coherent concepts, I now take great pleasure in heaping science's plate to overflowing with the amazing biblical order empirically existing between these constellations and those symbols. Note Pegasus to your far left the winged horse bearing God's provisions for his people. Pegasus overlays the great eagle's right wing. The Old Testament of the Bible is full of references to God's provision and the security brought by his right arm to his believers. Cygnus, Christ ever with us, overlays the great eagle's head. A point is even carved there to receive Gamma Cygni, Cygnus center star. Jesus often said that he spoke or did nothing that his father had not told him to do or say. Jesus was God's plan to defeat evil and save those caught in it. Cygnus' location in the mind of the great eagle is immensely meaningful. To the north of this site, scattered through Russia's Ural Mountains, was a Neolithic culture for whom the goose, as which Cygnus is also portrayed, played the central role of its mythology. In a later video, I will show you how significant Cygnus was to the people of Gobekli Tepe as well. On the eagle's left wing, Hercules, depicting Christ's descent into Hades and his return from there possessing the keys to death's gate, overlays the celestial north pole, which the ancients of this region, the Ural Mountains, and pretty much the rest of the north considered to be the entrance to the place of the dead. Rescue from the eternal grip of death was the most significant provision Jesus' death and resurrection brought to us mortals on the wings of Pegasus. That the great eagle was carved onto the pillar in this position for receiving those three constellations portraying the central theme of Jesus' gospel very well identifies the great eagle with Jesus' Father. Overlaying the vulture chick to the great eagle's left is Bootes, that constellation representing the resurrected Christ's return from heaven to end mankind's evil and reign over the yet mortal people of earth for a thousand years. Just behind that chick is the northern crown, that diadem of rain which serpents, the snake, struggles to steal. In a later video, I will show you how the locations of Ophiuchus, the snake restrainer, Aquila, Sagita, and Delphinus substantiate and flesh out the messages of these constellations we've just discussed. Francis Rolston discovered that the constellations of the Bible's Maseroth were representing the very aspects of Jesus Christ, his work, and its effects, fully 150 years before Pillar 43 was unearthed. Therefore, we know the gospel meanings she was able to ascribe to each constellation were not chosen by her to deliberately make these correlations. 
Pillar 43's own symbols were recognized to be representing death and resurrection in the ancient terms of well-known motifs it shares with Katal Hayuk, Neolithic Jericho, and other Mesopotamian areas. And remember, all of this biblical correlation occurs on the pillar just below its amazingly accurate depiction of the biblical narrative of the Great Flood. That combined with this perfectly communicative overlay of those constellations onto these symbols, demands the Holy Spirit's communication with Enoch, Noah, and even Francis Rolston as the only explanation of these extensively detailed, deeply meaningful, biblically correlating interrelationships. These interrelationships suggest that some very ancient myths originated here. We will explore in another video a few paralleling myths and Gobekli Tepe symbols found around the world, just as would be expected if the whole of Earth's ancient population had been scattered throughout the world from this one place of Mesopotamia after that biblical collapse of Babel's Tower. Now, let's draw a line from, from Cassiopeia, the seed bearer, down through Cygnus, continuing between Sagittarius and Scorpio on through Ara, the altar of God's wrath overturned onto the earth. That line approximates the Milky Way, which came to be considered by many ancient cultures, mostly of the southern hemisphere, as the path walked by the souls of the dead to either their place of rest or doom. Why are we now talking about the place of the dead reached by a path through the Milky Way, after having discussed the celestial North Pole as the entrance to the place of the dead. Shouldn't the symbols be consistent about such a fundamental concept? Yes, they should. And they are. People are inconsistent. Therefore, they see inconsistent concepts in consistent symbols. Mythologists have discovered two basic categories of religious myth emerging from Paleolithic symbolism and extending down through history to many aboriginal cultures of today. One category is the myths of sky gods. The other is those myths of earth gods, usually in some form of a mother goddess. Other symbols on the pillar seem to depict some fundamental religious disparity occurring in Gobekli Tepe's days of use. But the pillar itself is quite clearly directing attention to the sky god and not to just any sky god, but to the god described by the Holy Bible. That is yet another giant proposition demanding more giant evidence. And as you might by now expect, we are going to find its verifying evidence right on the face of Pillar 43. Cygnus, overlaying the head of the great vulture eagle, as if it were projected from the mind of the great eagle, is only a part of that concept's verification. It's a bird, a critter of the sky, and it overlays another bird of the sky. Moreover, even the enclosure in which that pillar was found verifies it to be depicting the sky god of the Holy Bible. The siding stone of this enclosure containing pillar 43 was found dislodged from its place of facing north. Andrew Collins proposed that Cygnus could be seen through the siding hole when the stone was in its place at the time of the monument's use. A person, a shaman perhaps, would have been able to look through the stone siding hole to see Deneb setting on the northwestern horizon, a quite magnificent sight that cannot have happened by chance alone. I needed verification of his proposition. So I set my astronomy software to view Gobekli Tepe's northern horizon at 9600 BC, and sure enough, I saw Cygnus circling the celestial north pole, its tail star, Deneb, dipping below the horizon once a day, rising again only hours later, a daily depiction of the seed's death and resurrection. Surely, the source of the world's many dying god myths. On that siding stone are carved what could be taken as two snakes representing a woman's legs in birthing position. God embedded his first prophecy given mankind within the curse he pronounced upon the snake 
which had enticed Eve to eat the forbidden fruit. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Some forthcoming child born of a woman would be fatally but not eternally wounded as represented by the snake bruising his heel. But that child would fatally, eternally wound the snake, bruising its head. The snake had enticed Eve to follow it, therefore she became made of the snake's ideology. As such, her legs on the siding stone are depicted by snakes. The siding hole is her vulva. Looking into it, her seed is seen in Cygnus' depiction of Jesus Christ, born of an imperfect woman, humbling himself to share in the imperfect form of man. The first prophecy God gave to mankind is clearly visible in Gobekli Tepe's motives. Gobekli Tepe, indeed, is depicting the Holy Bible's sky god. Everywhere you see Christians, you see crosses. The crescent moon is likewise prominent amongst Muslims, and the star of David amongst Jews. People multiply the symbols of their deepest faith. The ancients did this as well. Mother goddess images are scattered around the world, maybe in different shapes going by different names through different stories, yet they are all the same concept, and most usually, wherever they went, the serpent was sure to follow. Here, at Gobekli Tepe, the waterfowl symbol is repeated prominently. We find the story of Cygnus' birth repeated on the top register of Pillar 43, essentially the same as it was introduced through the siding stone. Cassiopeia, with her legs in birthing position, overlays the pillar just below the waterfowl chick, obviously to intimate its birth. Of course, chicks are hatched, but metaphor is more a communication than a technicality. Finding this intimation overlaying a room of the intentionally depicted arc surfing the biblical flood, we can be sure these constellations in the pillar's symbols are depicting the woman bearing the seed promised to crush the serpent's head, the first prophecy God gave to mankind before he later drowned all but those ate aboard his ark. And those snakes he cursed in giving that prophecy creep everywhere through everything of Gobekli Tepe, just like evil creeps throughout all of mankind. But this chick is those snakes' demise. So why a waterfowl chick? Why is the savior of mankind from evil, Jesus Christ, who will eventually be crowned king of kings at his return, represented by the chick of a lowly waterfowl instead of a glorious eagle. One day Jesus upset the Jews with a creepy saying, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread which I shall give for the life of the world is my flesh. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. He who eats this bread will live forever. Have you ever enjoyed a big old roast goose? Mankind has been eating goose nearly all its existence. To these ancients, goose was as much a staple of man's mortal life as the Christian communion service is a staple of man's eternal life. North of Gobekli Tepe, beyond the land between the Black and the Caspian Seas, spreading into the Ural Mountains of Russia, lived a Neolithic population producing thousands of goose symbols. Orthodox archaeology views them as a depiction of their dietary staple, and that is somewhat right, but that concept falls short of the total information you now know. 
Yet that's just one reason the ancients used a goose to represent the seed of the woman sent to crush the serpent's head, the prophecy God gave to their ancestors, Adam and Eve. About Jesus' identity with God, Paul wrote to the Philippians, Though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taken the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. Jesus humbled himself to become a lowly, wholly innocent sacrifice, bringing eternal life to anyone who accepts it. The lowly goose is sacrificed as the food of life. The orthodox viewpoint understands that these ancients elevated the waterfowl to a divine stature. But orthodoxy will spit molten nails at my proposition that those ancients knew the essential theme of God's salvation plan through the inspirational work of God's Holy Spirit upon Enoch. Let's hear the Holy Bible say it again. In many and various ways God spoke of old to our fathers by the prophets, one of whom was Enoch, but in these last days he has spoken to us by a son. Through that son he spoke and worked the gospel planned in his great mind. As Jesus said many times, Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. The constellations of our skies are one of the many and various ways the Almighty Lord God spoke through his prophets, Enoch and Noah. The symbols of Pillar 43 carved to receive the overlay of those constellations was Noah presenting to our fathers what God had prophesied to Enoch. Look! Cygnus is embedded in the mind of the great eagle. This constellation is also known as the Northern Cross. By the plan his father had in mind, Jesus died on the cross to appease God's wrath over our sin. In part two of this introduction, you will see the amazing place the Southern Cross overlays Pillar 43's imagery. But for now, Note the upright symbol in front of the waterfowl at the end of the Path of Moons. It appears to be standing in attention to hear the waterfowl's directives. Below it, another symbol is falling for the lies of a snake's tail faking a waterfowl beak. This small batch of symbols will require a video of its own, so many are the biblical meanings correlating with its imagery. I propose that one of its many messages keys one or the other of two constellation overlays onto Pillar 43 for showing one or the other of two themes involved in the Gospel of Jesus Christ. The genuine waterfowl, speaking to the upright eye, keys on to the pillar those constellations depicting God's plan for saving whoever will see, hear, and turn to the truth through Jesus Christ for help. That waterfowl speaking to these folks of upright heart and mind is Cygnus, overlaying the great eagle's head. Similarly, the bird beak faking snake tail lying to the fallen eye keys Scorpio onto the pillar with its small set of constellations depicting God's wrath poured onto truth's deniers. We are currently discussing the Cygnus overlay. We will introduce the Scorpio overlay in part two of this introduction. The depiction of the plan God had in mind for this seed's crushing of the snake's head spreads down through the Milky Way in more Maseroth imagery, as that imagery had been rediscovered by Francis Rolston entirely one century and a half before Gobekli Tepe was ever known. Yet another of reality's evidences headed for Orthodoxy's sneaky dumpster. But don't think that Cygnus' representation of Jesus Christ as a waterfowl means he was never represented as an eagle. The Bible extensively uses eagle metaphors to make Savior imagery. This waterfowl flies down the Milky Way, passing by Aquila, 
the eagle shot down by Sagittarius' arrow. Both Aquila and Sigita, the arrow, overlay the main vulture, identifying Christ as a victorious eagle, shot dead, yet resurrected and flying to its appointed place for conquering evil's king of death. Everyone with more than a perfunctory knowledge about the zodiac's classic imagery of this constellation knows that Sagittarius has his bow drawn to shoot Scorpio through the heart. They also know this scene takes place in the area of sky often called the Southern Gate, through which the sun passes once a year from Sagittarius into Scorpio. Of course, the sun passes once a year from any one constellation into the next, as well. Why aren't those gates named? Could the reason be the galactic center located right in the middle of the southern gate? An aspect of reality delivering a metaphor of central meaning to what occurs for mortal man in this place? The end of death? The end of evil? The victory of all who believe in Jesus Christ, the great eagle, the bread of life? Here Jesus is represented as a centaur ready to perform his victorious duty in perfect accord with the plan his father had in mind. Francis Rolston determined that the centaur was the zodiacal representation of Jesus Christ. Students of mythology know centaurs as lascivious boys who love to abduct and rape the girls. Is that Rolston's giant oops? Or is that humanity's lying, pying, liberal twisting of the Lord God's holy prophecies, the same lying, pying, liberal twisting of God's holy Bible done throughout mankind's various idolatries and denominational theologies? So, are there any symbols the ancients left for us to know they depicted that great seed of the woman by the centaur long before ancient liberals took to twisting it into a four-legged rapist? Should we even ask? You've already seen it. Those of you adept at seeing patterns already know what I am going to say. Recall the three constellations prominently overlaying the great vulture eagle. Do you see it coming? In the head, in the mind of the great eagle, is this Christ of whom we talk. The right wing of the great eagle is overlaid by the provisions of Christ's work carried to us on the wings of a flying horse. The other wing is overlaid by Christ's entrance into the place of the dead to bring back from there his total control over death. Jesus Christ crucified and resurrected. Since these three symbols all represent Jesus Christ in this one place of ultimate victory and authority, might they not be abbreviated into the metaphor of a Pegasus Hercules, a horseman, the centaur? Good enough. When Jesus Christ returns from the right side of his Father in heaven to carry peace, prosperity, and great joy to the surviving mortals of mankind, all those who refuse to acknowledge him to be precisely what God's Holy Bible revealed about him will be rubbed out in the greatest outpouring of God's wrath mankind had experienced to that day. Below the dispatched scorpion's tail is Ara, the altar of God's flaming wrath overturning onto earth. Seen enough? Well, there's so much more. But that is the victory story told in the Milky Way. Even Sadie, at five years old, knew to thank God for information. Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. When multiple chemists compared notes on chemical reactions, the periodic table emerged. Observations are the bones of concepts. Coherence is the sinew and flesh of understanding. Together they embody knowledge. The periodic table was not developed without chemists humbling themselves to the implications made by the results of experiments. You must humble yourself like a child to the coherence of empirical observations to learn, even if it involves the Holy Bible, else you will never know anything more than what you knew before. Theory after theory regarding Gobekli Tepe have been dismissed for lacking the support of observed evidence. 
but every point of this Enoch theory is drawn from observations of Pillar 43, the sighting stone, the constellations, and even of the intangible realities of Francis Rolston's Gospel in the Stars, the Holy Bible's prophecies, and the Biblical Flood narrative. My first video presented the observation of that narrative carved onto Pillar 43's top register. Every symbol on Pillar 43 and every constellation in that section of the night sky correspond with each other. As clearly as the upper register portrays the Great Flood, the rest of this pillar's symbols avail the gospel messages their corresponding constellations present. Cassiopeia in the birthing position just below the waterfowl chick, Cepheus portraying the king of kings in the room of the ibex having the greatest horns, Israel's constellation Ursa Minor bearing today's celestial north pole, and Cygnus our sacrifice from the mind of God. The gospel meanings of Pegasus on the one wing and of Hercules on the other show the ancient centaur to be representing Christ, our victor, correcting ancient liberal blasphemies of its being a rapist. Another of the many harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. We saw Ara, the flaming altar of God's wrath, pouring on to the world but we didn't mention its place at the beak of the vulture carrying a headless chap. In our next video, we will explain that, as well as Lyra, the musical instrument of praise located at the beak of the main vulture above. We noted the main vulture's identity with Christ by Aquila and Sigita. We will see his resurrection to eternal life shown in Delphinus all three overlaying that main vulture's body. We observed Boötes, Christ's quick return, overlaying the vulture chick where Corona Borealis, the northern crown, expresses the returned Christ's millennial reign on earth, the victory story as told in the Milky Way, where Sagittarius shoots Scorpio, the sting of death, through the heart. And nobody must take my word for any of this. Everyone can observe it for themselves in complete accord with science's consistency principle. Appendix 2 of my book, Clear Signs of Trouble and Great Joy, tells you how to observe this overlay for yourselves. The 19th century theologians, Joseph Cease and E.W. Bullinger, each wrote a book explaining the gospel in the stars as rediscovered by Francis Rolston. All three books are available on Amazon for a whole lot cheaper than what you risk by denial without observation. Pillar 43's complete correspondence with Francis Rolston's Gospel in the Stars irrefutably evidences the reality of the Lord God's highly communicative Holy Spirit. The origin of the classical zodiac imagery can now be understood as the work of God's prophet Enoch just as that idea has been speculated for many centuries. Yet adults are too ingrained in 21st century mechanistically material science to even open their eyes and see these actual observations of reality. Their beliefs are too shaped by 21st century scientific guessing to hear the coherence this enormous set of real observations speak. The 21st century's mystical paradigms close adults' minds to the scientific statements made by the Holy Bible. Let sun, moon, and stars be for signs. There will be signs in sun, moon, and stars. The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims His handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words their voices not heard, yet their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. Can you lead forth the Maseroth in their season? Why do adults abandon the Maseroth simply because they cannot lead it? Could it be that what God speaks through our physical reality conflicts with mankind's agenda? Can its correspondence with the Holy Bible be their fear? The Holy Bible says the sun, moon, and stars make messages. It calls them signs. 
I call them clear signs of trouble and great joy, and I treat them scientifically, for they themselves show science's refusal to explain any phenomena by any call upon God to be deceitful foolishness. All of you have now observed what I have observed, the symbols, the constellations, the ascriptions, and the gospel told in the Bible all of them interlocking seamlessly around the bones of an ancient history, fleshing out a clear and coherent understanding that God exists as described by the Holy Bible, communicating with man through historic testimonies, concepts, symbols, and prophecies. You have seen with your own eyes the way he spoke of old to our fathers by his prophet Enoch, and how appropriate it is that he presented Enoch's dire warning in those pools of evidence for our current scientifically oriented generation to discover through the scientific method. Do not recoil at the thought of science discovering God's effects. Science is merely one vehicle for discovery. Divine inspiration is another. God's kingdom harbors no jealousy between the two. Before today's God denying evolution-oriented bias drove science over the cosmological cliff, the earlier scientists of the 18th century were driven down the highway of God's existence to explore the splendors and utility of his creation. It is time for the truth to raise science up from the abyss of mankind's deceitful agendas. True science goes wherever the highway of evidence leads. But if your eyesight is yet too clouded by life's struggles and personal agendas for you to see what is now scientifically knowable and faithfully understandable about God's Holy Spirit and the Holy Bible it inspired, part two of this introduction will double the evidence as part one more than sufficiently amassed. Further videos will only carry you into more evidence. For just like the periodic table was not completed by Dmitri Mendeleev, but is yet in the process of predicting more new elements for further discovery, Gobekli Tepe, Noah's monument to God's Ark, is yet in the process of predicting for discovery further concepts about God's communication of old to our fathers through his prophets. Future videos will show those to you as well. Science can only take notes on what reality shows. It does not make reality. Therefore, it cannot refuse any explanation of phenomena simply because it does not want to discover that explanation to be real. A humbler science will go to wherever reality's evidence leads, which, of course, our current scientific arrogance has claimed to do without having done. God's Holy Spirit is the only explanation of this phenomena scientifically discovered in those pools of evidences. Science must come along for this ride. My next video will discuss the two timelines clearly showing that Enoch's warning was indeed directed to us today. If you're just too curious about them to wait, my book, Clear Signs of Trouble and Great Joy, discusses them. Chapter 4 presents a short version of Francis Rolston's Gospel in the Constellations. Chapter 9 discusses the basics of those two timelines. Chapters 1 and 2 discuss the two most fundamental principles for knowing things truly, acknowledging observations and researching their coherence, just as Jesus said, eyes to see and ears to hear. Should you bet your eternal destiny on unscientific guessing? Or is it wiser to place your bet on the best evidence available? Jesus said everyone would be carrying on as if he never existed when he returns, just as they carried on in Noah's day as if the flood was a joke. Our generation discovered Noah's Pillar 43 bearing Enoch's warning to the generation of the tribulation, below its portrayal of the great flood that washed up their pre-diluvian denial, for the sake of your eternal destiny, listen to these coherent evidences. Come to Christ like 
children with prayers of repentance on your lips, rather than spitting science's shifting, whispering excuses into his face. For the Holy Bible's gospel written in the constellations, corresponding seamlessly with Pillar 43's symbols, is only a tiny tip of the enormous iceberg of signs made in the heavens, correlating with biblical prophecies and histories, warning of Jesus Christ's return, to convict all the ungodly of all their deeds of ungodliness which they have committed in such an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him, as Jesus' brother Jude quoted Enoch. 